Continuing the tale of the collapse of the British car industry, we look now to the formation of the car firm that would come to define its protracted demise, the corporate monolith that was the British Leyland Motor Corporation of 1968, an unmanageable web of brands, models, factories, executives and workers with a scale that was truly impossible to comprehend. And it was through this attempt to create Britain's equivalent of General Motors that the UK auto industry would be certain to face its inevitable destruction. Starting in 1966, the largest car firm in the UK by far and away was the British Motor Holdings or BMH, the fruits of a somewhat convoluted merger between the British Motor Corporation and Jaguar that had taken place in the wake of BMC's own purchase of the Press Steel Company, a car body manufacturer that had nearly every car maker in Britain as customers. While opposing BMH was the Leyland Group of the highly ambitious Donald Stokes, who, after having seen his prospective tie up with Jaguar fall through, when the latter's founder and chairman, Sir William Lyons, opted instead for a deal with BMC, chose instead to expand the influence of his company by taking hold of Rover in 1967, one of Britain's most renowned car brands and a major player in the world of high end executive models. Donald Stokes, who had started his career as a salesman in the Leyland Truck Company, had, through his later management of the firm, been able to turn what was once one of many heavy vehicle producers into perhaps the largest builder of trucks and buses in the world thanks to his aggressive expansion policy. Earning a fortune in exports, as exemplified in his audacious £9 million sale of Leyland Olympian buses to Cuba in 1964, despite a severing of political ties between the countries of NATO and the newly established communist nation. His success in the heavy vehicle market, leading the emboldened Stokes to move rapidly into the field of mass production cars, through his purchase of the Standard Triumph Group in 1961, and later his purchase of Rover during 1967, the Leyland Group being among the most successful car firms in the UK by the end of the decade, thanks to a slew of highly popular Triumph sports cars and saloons, Standard Economy cars, and the pre-existing executive ranges of the newly acquired Rover company, although behind the scenes, there was a lack of logic in much of his thinking, especially when it came to maintaining production of cars which shared the same market segment, performed largely the same mechanically and functionally, but had no parts compatibility at all, as was the case of the Triumph 2000, which went head-to-head -head with its rival-turned-stablemate, the Rover P6. Regardless, the Leyland Group was in full bloom, and by 1967 was able to control 16% of the UK car market, making both Stokes and his firm one of the most influential forces within the wider industry, and quickly saw that the situation in the ranks of BMH were exceptionally bleak, the Mini making no profit despite its sales success, the Austin 1100 waging all-out war against the Ford Cortina for the mid-range market, only for it to be hamstrung by woeful unreliability and ruinous warranty claims by customers, the Austin 1800 being a sales disaster that flopped against forecasts worse than any other model of its class, and the upcoming Austin 3-litre saloon, as the proposed company flagship, being merely an 1800 with a revised rear end, and nothing else to truly differentiate it from its lower-end brethren. BMH having not launched a new car since the 1964 release of the 1800, and was now hemorrhaging money despite obtaining 28% of the British car market. Stokes' motions as to potentially acquiring BMH, being encouraged further by the then Minister of Technology, Tony Benn, acting on behalf of Prime Minister Harold Wilson, as he had noted that the ailing company, while plentiful in low-end family cars, luxury saloons and sports cars, had no mid-range or executive models to call its own, something the Leyland Group had an abundance of through its Triumph and Rover divisions. Therefore, Following a meeting between Stokes and BMH chairman George Harriman, the announcement was made on January 17, 1968, that British Motor Holdings would merge with the Leyland Group to form the British Leyland Motor Corporation, which would become effective from May of the same year and thus create the fifth largest car company in the world, although in truth, the terms of the deal to merge the two firms had not been fully agreed by all of the company directors, and during the next five months, the proposed union of BMH and Leyland nearly dissolved entirely as executives vied for various commanding positions within the firm. All while the continued fiscal situation at BMH meant more money was still flowing steadily out the door, exacerbated further by the decision during the spring of 1968 to move all mini-production facilities from the former Morris factory in Cowley near Oxford to the Austin factory in Longbridge so as to make assembly space for the upcoming Austin Maxi. The stoppage in mini-production as all shells, equipment and workers were transferred en masse from one plant to the other over the course of several weeks costing BMH an absolute fortune in lost revenues and shipping expenses. Aside from the production reshuffle, executive staff were also chopped and changed as part of the agreement outlined in the merger, although the manner in which this was carried out caused strong friction between the former BMH and Leyland managers. 
with perhaps the most notable loss for the firm going forward being Joe Edwards, who resigned in April 1968 due to his inability to work with the sudden influx of new executives from Leyland, as well as being thoroughly opposed to the merger in general. While Harriman would remain chairman of British Leyland until the autumn of that year, before stepping down in favour of Stokes, the latter fashioning himself as the captain of the British auto industry through an intensive media promotional campaign to drum up support for his new car-building empire. Though the honeymoon period wore off rapidly, when Stokes was made fully aware of the dilapidated condition BMH was in upon the merger, with only two new models in the pipeline as the Austin Maxi and the Mini Clubman, while the only other model undergoing serious development was the superb Mini 9X concept as an unofficial standalone scheme by Alakis Agonis. These problems compounded by overmanning at the 42 operational plants spread far and wide across the globe, and company directors who had little to no comprehension of their roles and responsibilities, the only crumb of comfort being that, on the surface at least, BMH's finances were not as dire as he had been led to believe, though in reality even this belied the fact that the entire business was teetering on total collapse, as its outdated models and biblical unreliability continued to see customers abandon the firm for the likes of Ford and Vauxhall. By the time of the merger, the company had the capacity to produce a million cars per year across 48 operational factories around the world, 23 of which were primary assembly plants and employed over 190,000 people. Although worse than the various woes with management, overmanning and an extreme lack of new models, the conditions at the Longbridge and Cowley plants, which were the company's two main mass production facilities, were beyond appalling. The Cowley plant clearly showing signs of advanced neglect, as its production lines and equipment dated back to the mid-1950s while at Longbridge, various expansions to the factory had been left half-finished or were not up to full production capacity at the time of the merger, a lack of centralised operations and rationalisation during the 1950s, as should have been undertaken despite the protestations of the trade unions, being the outcome of the cutthroat policies of Leonard Lord to expand the influence of the firm as far as possible in order to deal with the problems of the day rather than address the prospects of the future. Stokes responding by turning to the Industrial Reorganisation Committee in order to arrange for a £25 million loan, which would be used to make improvements to the factories and start restructuring the company. Though this should have been the great turnaround for British Leyland early on in its formation, lessons remained unlearned as to the cooperation of the various divisions. The them and us attitude of the long-suffering Morris under the thumb of Austin, now being repeated for Austin and Morris under the thumb of Triumph, with Stokes, as former chairman of Leyland, stacking the executive staff and directors of British Leyland firmly in his favour, through the installation of ex-Leyland Group managers, most of whom had little to no experience when it came to working for a large car company, the only exception being John Barber, who Stokes intended to groom as one of his two sidekicks alongside George Turnbull to help him manage the British Leyland conglomerate, only for his delegation of certain aspects of the company management to Turnbull, giving the latter the impression that he was to be Stokes' sole business partner in the venture, notions that would ultimately lead to more friction being made between the two executives. During the same year, the Industrial Reorganisation Committee grilled Stokes as to the overmanning and low productivity of British Leyland, together with the ever-present poor industrial relations, Stokes being stuck well between a rock and a hard place, as in order to keep up the productivity of the company, he would have to get on even terms with the trade unions so as to stop the pervasive strike action, but contrarily, to slash the problem of overmanning, would have to cut an estimated 47,000 of the 190,000 jobs at British Leyland, a move that the trade unions would never accept thus meaning that, in order to keep the unions on side, he simply chose to maintain the outrageous staff numbers and overmanning in exchange for upping production and selling more cars, part of a highly ambitious widespread expansion to the firm into new markets, but one, thanks to a complete lack of forward planning, that had absolutely no set direction, as illustrated with British Leyland's first brand new model, the Austin Maxi, a car built to do battle in the emerging hatchback market with the likes of the Ford Cortina and Hillman Hunter but was instead the product of an outdated design with a somewhat drab styling that had been corrupted by accountants into an underwhelming little car that already looked 10 years old on the day it was launched, with even Stokes and Barber noting that the car was simply not good enough to win sales from the Cortina or the Hunter, and should have been either scrapped or thoroughly redesigned before reaching the marketplace. In response to the calamitous launch of the Maxi, former Triumph engineer Harry Webster was appointed as technical director in order to oversee an improvement to the Austin Morris division of British Leyland, though his rise to the position meant that, controversially, Sir Alakis Agonis was forced out of his technical director role without consultation on the grounds that he had lost touch with what the buying public wanted, despite the fact that, behind the scenes, he was developing a hatchback mini replacement, dubbed the 9X, 
that would have easily answered the demands for the small car buyer of the early 1970s, leading to Isagonis' resignation from British Leyland in 1971, while Webster, at the urging of Stokes, was forced to develop a hasty future strategy that emulated the decisions being made at Ford, even taking on Ford's Red Book evaluation method, whereby all products inherited from the former BMH would be put under serious scrutiny, leading to a revision of the suspension system for the Austin 1100 being scrapped alongside the Mini 9X project, and all spending at Longbridge being brought to a halt, long-term intentions being to abandon the badge engineering practice, to which Stokes was thoroughly opposed, with the new hierarchy being for the Morris Mark to produce low-end mass-production economy cars that would steal sales back from Ford and Vauxhall, complemented by Austin, which would be the innovative and forward-thinking brand appealing to a more upmarket clientele. The result of this new corporate direction came with the 1971 release of the Morris Marina, which finally killed off the Morris Minor after 23 years of production, while 1973 saw the arrival of the highly innovative Austin Allegro as a replacement for the decade-old Austin 1100, the revised range of British Leyland, comprising the Mini at the very bottom of the market, above which was the Marina, the Allegro, and finally the Austin 1800 at the top of the range, which by this point was selling in sporadic numbers. 1970 seeing the management approving the creation of a new large family car to replace the 1800, but this came at the cost of several promising concepts to replace the Mini, the view of the management being that, as long as the Mini continued to sell, helped along by the recent launch of the Mini Clubman, there was no imperative need to replace it, the problem of new products being made worse by the fact that the Longbridge Drawing Office, though very talented, was undermanned and spread too thin, as they were tasked with developing mass production cars for the Austin Morris Division, luxury cars for the Jaguar, Rover and Triumph divisions, and the rapidly aging products of the Specialist division that held under its banner the MG and Austin Healey sports car brands, several concurrent high-priority models existing at the same time that included a brand new winning sports car for Triumph that would do battle with the Datsun 240Z on the American market, a new executive model to replace the Rover P6 and Triumph 2000, and a new lower-end large family car to see off the Austin 1800. To free up cash, cutbacks were needed, but again the handling of these went poorly, examples including the severing of franchise agreements with the still highly influential dealerships, who in response simply saw the way the wind was blowing and took on contracts with Datsun and Toyota for the ever-expanding import market, while any attempts to close surplus car plants were challenged tooth and nail by the trade unions, with Stokes still firm in the belief that he could sell every car that was built, even though he was under pressure from the IRC regarding the sheer number of lost days work and lost production with Pat Lowry being appointed in 1970 as Director for Industrial Relations at British Leyland, the first time in the company's history that such a role was felt to be necessary, but Lowry was ultimately unable to remedy the situation in any way, leading to the corporation changing the terms and conditions of 134,000 workers over a period of three years, most notably the replacement of the existing piecework system, wherein the rate for workers was determined by how many cars they built, to a flat daily rate a disastrous move that basically gave the line workers no incentive to produce cars in a timely and efficient manner, as they knew they were going to be paid no matter how many or how few cars they actually built, the introduction of the flat rate illustrating how little the management knew when it came to controlling the finances of the company, while cost overruns were running at huge figures per car built, the theory being that, under the standard costing system, British Leyland were losing money on every mini they built, but this assumed that the cars were being produced at a standard cost with the reality being that labour costs for British Leyland were some 30-80% to 80 higher than standard, though the management refused to acknowledge their mistake. Although in principle the fixed-rate system was much fairer, it did little to curb the strike action, with a figure of 5 million man-hours lost in 1970 due to industrial disputes, rising to a staggering 10 million the following year, while in May 1973, to coincide with the launch of the Allegro, Stokes stated his intention to carry on as chairman for another six years, and would implement far-reaching management changes, including the promotion of John Barber from his post as the company finance director into the role of deputy chairman, whereupon he would oversee an intended major expansion program for British Leyland that reflected the management's confidence in the ability of the Allegro to match the sales success of the preceding Austin 1100, this scheme hoping to see an increase in production to 1.5 million cars per year, coupled to various new models, engines and factories to be introduced further down the line. Unfortunately, due to Stokes having given George Turnbull, now head of the Austin Morris Division, the impression that he was being lined up as second-in-command, the promotion of Barber resulted in great bitterness that destroyed their corporate relationship, and amid further disagreements over the planned reorganisation of the administrative structure of British Leyland so that all marketing and management would be centralised, 
a scheme he correctly predicted would do nothing but further alienate the workforce from the executive ranks, together with the construction of the 14-storey Leyland House in Marylebone, central London, to become the British Leyland Company headquarters and administrative centre, a strongly disillusioned Turnbull eventually resigned, despite the fact that under his tenure, he had turned the Austin Morris division from a £16 million loss in 1968 to a £17 million profit by 1973, contributing almost 50% to the entire group's profits. Turnbull later going on to have a pivotal role in expanding the South Korean car maker Hyundai into one of the world's most profitable auto firms, thanks largely to the pioneering Hyundai Pony of 1975. Back at British Leyland, the situation became increasingly dire, as Donald Stokes' early promotional campaign now left him as the figurehead with which to blame all the company's woes, while other managers and executive staff ducked responsibility for the firm's many failures. The resignation of Turnbull, only five months after Barber's promotion to deputy manager, being another public relations blow due to his strong reputation within the company. The direction of British Leyland at the time of Turnbull's departure being that Barber desired pushing the firm more upmarket so as to compete with Ford. While Turnbull was of the opinion that the brand had not the strength to make such a move and should instead play to its talents through investment in mass production car models like the Marina and the Allegro, the fiscal situation by 1973 showing that British Leyland had made a profit of £51 million for that year, which was a modest success, but not meeting Barber's strict forecast when it came to creating a new model program to replace the Marina with smaller Triumph models like the Dolomite and the Toledo, as well as desiring a large cut to excess manning levels in car plants through the initial employment of a no-hiring policy, while at the same time quietly slashing jobs in a manner that wouldn't arouse the attention of the trade unions, eventually cutting approximately 30,000 workers without anyone noticing. Barber's strict but ambitious plan to refresh British Leyland was sadly very brief, as in October of the same year, following the outbreak of the Yom Kippur War between the Arab nations and the State of Israel, the Organisation of Arab Petroleum Exporting Countries, or OPEC, implemented an oil embargo on shipments to countries that had supported Israel in their fight against Egypt and Syria, cutting the production of oil by 5% and stopping shipments to Canada, Japan, the Netherlands, the United Kingdom and the United States followed later by Portugal, Rhodesia and South Africa, the results of the embargo leading to a massive spike in fuel prices and a crushing recession that burst the fragile economic bubble that had been enjoyed since the end of World War II, sending the cost of living skyrocketing and seeing the highest unemployment rate in the UK since the Great Depression of 1929, the blow of the oil crisis being a crippling one for British Leyland, as against the forecast profit for 1974, the firm instead made a £16.6 million loss, while at the same time the Mini, as had been the case in the aftermath of the 1956 Suez crisis, became the best-selling car in Britain thanks to its superb fuel economy, with the brand new Morris Marina seeing its sales tumble as drivers sought cars that would hit them as little as possible in the pocket, the Marina's less-than-stellar sales output being endemic of all new cars that have been released so far by the company. As both the Allegro and the Maxi failed to meet their prospective sales output, the booming sales for the 1972 fiscal year, which had seen a jump from 1.3 to 1.6 million cars sold in that period alone, now crashing dismally without British Leyland having been able to exploit this uplift in commercial performance, as the management had once again been embroiled in a massive battle against the trade unions in order to get the cars actually produced. Even though this was a problem endemic to the firm since its very formation, industrial relations were now at an all-time low, and while this wasn't unique to British Leyland, with Ford also seeing the stuttered sales entry of its new Cortina, the strike action at Longbridge and Cowley had incapacitated the company's two main mass production facilities at a time when they were needed most, thereby seeing the largely consistent 40% market share held by British Leyland collapse catastrophically to 33.1% by the end of 1972, the worst single-year fall in market share for a car firm in British history, this figure remaining at 30% for the remainder of the decade, and the ground well and truly surrendered to Ford and its Mark III Cortina, as well as newcomers in the form of the Datsun Cherry and the Toyota Celica. The inability for the flagship Allegro and Marina models to reach forecasts, combined with strikes and all manner of mechanical, technical and cosmetic faults, leading to British Leyland's backers, the city banks, to become increasingly nervous as to the future of the firm. And by the summer of 1974, the company was forced to scale back the proposed expansion outlined by Stokes and Barber, the ailing car firm being forced to turn to the city banks in order to provide medium-term finance that amounted to an overdraft of £150 million, while also instigating talks with the Department of Trade and Industry, during which British Leyland outlined the proposed corporate expansion, with a view that the government may provide £100 million of cash injections to see these through to fruition, with an emergency cash conservation plan imposed from September 1974, 
although by this point British Leyland lost £23.9 million for the first quarter of the 1974 fiscal year, together with an overdraft of £148 million, as opposed to £105 million in bank deposits. The banks that had helped to finance British Leyland, though, were still very concerned as to the validity of the firm's cash projections, and thus hired the accountants Thomas McClintock and Company to act as consultants who would perform an audit for British Leyland's books. These investigations being conducted amid talks between the Department of Trade and Industry, the accountants and British Leyland themselves on November 27, 1974, during which Stokes and Barber declared that the company would reach the limit of their overdraft in January 1975, and it was also likely that they would not be given further facilities from the banks. Tony Benn, the man who had encouraged the merger of BMH and the Leyland Group, speaking in the House of Commons on December 6th and outlining to Parliament that, as a major employer in the West Midlands, it was of paramount importance that British Leyland be not allowed to collapse, and that the government should provide state funding, plans being subsequently drawn up for the emergency assistance of British Leyland, while Sir Don Ryder was appointed on December 18th to prepare a report into the future of the company and how to run it under the auspices of government control, followed by government approval for a further £50 million of bank lending, the fiscal situation by the start of 1975, being that, while Stokes informed the media that the firm had obtained £2.3 million of profit before tax, in the first half of the year it had lost £16.6 million due to a three-day week imposed by the government in the wake of the coal miners and railway strikes, while in the second half of the year, British Leyland made nearly £19 million profit before tax, but after paying £9 million in tax and taking into account the expense of closing the former Morris factory in Zeetland, Australia, at a cost of £15.7 million following the disastrous launch of the Leyland P-76 sedan, the corporation lost £23.9 million compared with a profit of £27.3 million in the previous 12 months. Amid Stokes quoting that at least £40 million would be needed for new engine development, and Barber outlining that the company would require as much as £100 million over the next five to six years in order to finance a £500 million to £600 million investment plan, early mutterings came about that the more profitable parts of the company, such as Jaguar, should be sold in order to drum up the necessary funds, although this proposal was vetoed by Stokes, who laid blame on British Leyland's dire situation at the doors of the strikers and the shop stewards, who antagonised relations between the workers and the management together with the fact that BMC's inability to develop a new range of cars in the mid-60s had left the company with a slew of long-outdated models, while having no future prospective cars in the pipeline for release at the time of the merger. The cars that had been released after the formation of British Leyland, namely the Morris Marina and Austin Allegro, demonstrating the best and worst of the firm, as the Marina sold in huge numbers despite its incredibly simplistic design that carried over many aspects from the 1948 Morris Minor, while the Allegro, as the forward-thinking and technically innovative barnstormer for British Leyland, was a commercial disaster, though the truth of the matter was simply that making such observations was now far too late to remedy them, and it was more an exercise in saving face as British Leyland continued to be lambasted by consumer groups and the national press, with Stokes being made the scapegoat of the company's woes, market share prices for the car builder dropping from 40.5% in 1968 to a meagre 30.9% by the start of 1975. In early 1975, Ryder, having undertaken an exhaustive audit of the rabbit warren that was British Leyland's various operational practices and aspects, released the first draft of his report, in which he outlined that the fundamental issues regarding the current state of the firm, dated back up to and beyond the merging of Austin and Morris to create the British Motor Corporation way back in 1952, with his report outlining that the main ailments of British Leyland comprised an appalling record across the factories for striking and industrial disputes, poor build quality leading to a tattered image for the cars that were able to be built between strikes, inter-factory competition and a lack of corporate unity under the British Leyland brand by the car makers brought together to form the company, seeing individual plants constantly trying to outdo one another, a model range with multiple cars occupying the same market segment and thus competing against themselves, and a weak and ineffective factory management that essentially answered to the shop stewards. The first draft of the Ryder Report being delivered to Tony Benn on March 26, 1975, only 14 weeks after being commissioned, and following much deliberation within the government, many figures of which demanded that the report not be published due to their vested interests in the company, the finalised document was eventually made public on April 23rd of the same year, and made the strict recommendations that Donald Stokes resign as company chairman, the outdated and unsafe factory machinery be replaced as a matter of highest urgency, a cohesive model strategy be devised to stop the pervasive overlap, the company build a new test and development centre in order to facilitate the more efficient creation of new cars, and industrial relation problems be eradicated. Further to the report, Ryder recommended that, 
In order to make the company viable and competitive by 1981, a capital expenditure of no less than £1.264 billion would be required from the government, together with £260 million worth of working capital, a sum that filled the government, especially Tony Benn, with consternation, although the alternative of allowing British Leyland to collapse was too terrible a proposition to entertain. As aside from those who worked directly for the firm, including line workers, managers, shop stewards, mechanics, dealers and other ancillary staff, in order to supply British Leyland with parts and equipments, hundreds of individual traders and businesses relied heavily on their ability to provide the car building giant with items such as carpets, seat covers, mechanical components for engines, suspensions, brakes and body shells, lights, electric wiring, even down to nuts and bolts. The collapse of British Leyland, with the cascade of vital lost contracts being incurred for suppliers across the UK, meaning that, at a minimum, over one million people would be left out of work if it was allowed to go under thus leading, at the behest of Prime Minister Harold Wilson, to Parliament agreeing the implementation of the plan at the first opportunity. And on June 27, 1975, the British Leyland Motor Corporation was replaced by British Leyland Limited, signifying that the company was now under government control, with Stokes being forced to step down as company chairman on October 3rd. Although, with the support of Wilson as a close personal friend, he was not fired completely from British Leyland, instead being placed in the position of non-executive chairman and taking the role of simply a figurehead rather than having any major power over corporate policy. Sir Ronald Edwards taking over as executive chairman of the firm, but would only see himself occupying this role for four months, as he tragically passed away on January 18, 1976, at the age of 65, leading to his replacement on February 28 by Sir Richard Dobson, the retiring chairman of British American Tobacco. Despite the sudden change in successive chairmen, the Ryder Report provided a very rosy picture of the future for the company with the aforementioned prospect that, if changes recommended were implemented, British Leyland could regain its lost ground and thereby maintain both a 33% share of the British car market and a 3.9% share of the European market by 1981, trumping Ford and its 21% share. Though in reality the picture was not as black and white as Ryder had envisaged, with Ford actually overtaking British Leyland to become the UK's best-selling car brand during 1977, despite the fact that against 650,000 cars being produced by British Leyland per year, Ford were only producing 406,000, this deficit being made up through the importing of cars from their other European operations, such as the Cologne factory in West Germany, which proved to be a useful strategy during the height of their own industrial relations strife at the Dagenham plant in East London during the mid-1970s, while the presence of Vauxhall and Chrysler, the latter of whom had purchased the former Roots Group in 1967, meant that year on year, the ratio of imported cars to domestically produced ones would continue to move in favour of the imports. Another interesting note of the Ryder Report was the fact that it made no recommendations for closing any of the 48 plants still in operation within the company, instead proposing that, in order for British Leyland to remain a presence on both the mass production car and specialist vehicle markets, it should be split up into four divisions, Leyland Cars, Leyland Trucks and Buses, Leyland International, and Leyland Special Products. The way in which Ryder managed to circumvent the trade unions, in the face of this reorganisation proposing the potential discontinuation of individual marks, being to ensure that each of the British Leyland sub-brands retained their independent identities, but had to pool their resources. Reorganising car production to reflect the fact that Austin Morris and the Specialist Division, which incorporated the Jaguar Triumph and Rover names, would need to become a single integrated car business, meaning that all development and marketing would be shared, the unenviable task of implementing these recommendations being laid at the door of former Managing Director of British Leyland's Body and Assembly Division, Derek Whitaker. Though originally this job had been slated for chief executive of Jaguar, Jeffrey Robinson, before he was sidelined following rumours of financial impropriety when he was head of the Italian Innocenti division of British Leyland during the early 1970s, ultimately leading to his forced resignation in 1976. Whitaker, as a quiet, no-nonsense manager, first ensuring the smooth transition of the separate Austin Morris and Specialist Division franchises into a unified entity. Crucially, in light of the Ryder Report's highly optimistic future for British Leyland, the validity of its predictions came under fire from many within the industry, the fundamental flaw of the Ryder plan being that it focused far too heavily on trying to expand the company out of its financial mess and not on actually building products that were popular among the buying public, Ryder embarking on a tour of the company's factories so as to curry support from the employees and boost their rock-bottom morale. Although in the face of the militant trade unions, which were able to garner stronger influence within the company ranks than the management, his attempt at revitalising the workforce fell rapidly on deaf ears, and did very little to motivate the staff, 
while the National Enterprise Board, as an arm of the government, was given the task of overseeing the running of British Leyland, reporting back to Parliament on its progress and ensuring that Ryder's plans for the company were being implemented, with Sir Don Ryder himself being made the first chairman of the organisation so as to see his proposals through to fruition. Ryder stating that under the National Enterprise Board, British Leyland should be partially nationalised and given large sums of state funding over the course of four years in order to guarantee its survival. Although existing shareholders would only be offered 10 pence per share for their holdings, with a nominal value of 50 pence, this figure having dropped from a peak of 80 pence in 1968 immediately following the merger. The government's shareholding thereby increasing with every successive year, but, contrary to popular belief, 100% of British Leyland was never taken under state control. Thus, British Leyland, now partially funded by the taxpayer, stumbled on through the mid-70s with a damning fiscal report, collapsing sales, outdated models, and industrial action that was crippling the firm's numerous plants and seeing car production reduced to a fraction of its competitors. But in the face of all these factors, order needed to be restored, and this would eventually come with a new management and a new policy, which would lead the ailing car maker into the next decade.